Hello everyone, thanks for clicking on my video today. Nolan is why and here's garbage. Christopher Nolan is one of the most fascinating filmmakers working today. While he regularly enjoys great critical and commercial success, his films are rarely put on the same pedestal as a Lynch or a Tarkovsky or a Kubrick, or any of the other great directors for that matter. One of the more noticeable weak points of Nolan's game has been his sound design, with particular focus given to the clarity of the dialogue on screen or lack thereof. But honestly, there are far deeper problems than unintelligible dialogue with the king of plot contrivances sound design philosophy. Let's find out what. Philosophy, woo! Yay! What is the Nolan style of sound design? Well, Richard King, the sound designer for Tenet, actually shed some light on this for us. Chris is trying to create a visceral emotional experience for the audience. Beyond merely an intellectual one. Like punk rock music, it's a full body experience. And dialogue is only one facet of the sonic palette. He wants to grab the audience by the lapels and pull them towards the screen. At the prime time, bitch. And not allow the watching of his films to be a passive experience. So I know what your first question is going to be. What the fuck is Dick King talking about? It's easy to read this quote and come to the conclusion that Nolan does audio the way he does because he doesn't trust his audience enough to pay attention. Though I think it's a bit more complicated than that. And I'll get into that later, but for now let's start on where it generally doesn't work. Tenet and Style Tenet, Nolan's latest picture, is a film about a man doing something, other characters doing something, and time travel being involved in some capacity. There is a story, allegedly, with themes, allegedly, but they're largely forgettable. Something about a Russian man? I think he has COVID or something. Regardless, we're here to talk about sound design. And I know just where to start. The restaurant scene. The restaurant scene features two characters sitting in a restaurant and engaging in a conversation for the first time in the film. Kat and the protagonist. And yes, that's his name. Mr. The Protagonist. Or just the Mr. Protagonist is his father. Whoop, pause. As an aside, no one has positively terrific character names. Anyone remember Hugh Mann? Yeah, me neither. Anyway, back to the video. So let's look at this place quickly. The space is intimate, refined. The other diners are eating slowly, delicately. Yet from the audio, you'd think the scene was taking place in a dishwasher. The extras aren't even in sync with the audio. Now this is just speculation, but I suspect that the audio used wasn't recorded on set, but either after the fact, or they're just stock noises that he's thrown onto the timeline. On top of this, the scene is entirely dominated by dialogue and music, with the opportunity to actually set the scene through audio cues going to waste. The scene moves onto the restaurant's kitchen, where a loud and violent fight takes place. That scene loses some of its edge, because the moment before it where two characters were just sitting down and conversing was at times louder and more audibly chaotic than the fight scene. Compare this to Jaws. In the opening, we get... So even before we see a frame of ocean, we know where the film is taking place, just from that simple sound cue. And here we can hear the lapping of the ocean water, casual conversation, that one douchebag at every party who insists on playing his guitar. If you listen real closely, you can even hear somebody smoking a blunt. Based on this one shot, a simple pan, the audience can identify that they're at a party and a fucking chill one at that. It establishes an easy tone, which is completely flipped on its head later, when Jaws attacks a lady in the ocean, in a scene that's still intense nearly 50 years after it was first viewed by a live audience. Nolan's reliance here on spamming noise onto the editing timeline actively harms the effectiveness of both of these scenes, and it's not like it's even a one-off. Take this scene where protagonist meets sexy vampire man, the scene starts out fine. We hear player characters' footsteps. This guy's footsteps. And the dialogue is mostly intelligible. It's bungee jumpable. I don't think bungee jumpable is a word. It may not be a word, but it may be your only way out of that place. During their conversation, we hear a horn honking. It may not be a word, but it may Then again. Maybe you're anywhere out of And again. That's not possible. Ten minutes. And again. Or well, into it, for that matter. We get it, it's busy outside. How's your parachuting? No, stop, we know it's fucking busy. Is there a crash? How does it add to the scene? The tone, the themes. Won't somebody think of the themes? 
By the way, I know that certain honks here sound like notes in the music, but I found the track for the scene and there's not a honk or blare to be heard. So I'm struggling to comprehend what's even going on at this point. Speaking of incomprehensible, dialogue. The dialogue in Tenet might be really good. Unfortunately, nobody has been able to contact Superman to confirm this. Most films use dialogue to convey information, character, exposition, to further arcs, and the overall plot. A requirement for this to work is for the audience to actually be able to hear it, which in a wicked subversion of expectations often isn't the case. Take the sailing scene. I said take the sailing scene. I said take the sailing scene. What? Oh my god, please turn down the fucking music. So, obviously this isn't good. In this scene, Kat attempts to assassinate her husband. Before she sends him to his death, she says um, something to him. Keep in mind, these may be the last words he will ever hear. Powerful. But seriously, what the fuck? I think the audio even peaks at one point. See, I'm not hearing that right. Or am I? Has this film driven me insane? You know what, I need to stop talking about Tenet for a little while, it's too negative. I need to bring some joy into this video, by talking about World War II. Dunkirk, and how it works. Sometimes. World War II, or uh-oh, SpaghettiOs, as the Germans call it, was one of the most brutal conflicts in history, characterised by mass genocide, bombing of civilians, and of course punctuated by the detonation of the nuclear bomb. So naturally, people love making movies about it. So Dunkirk is a film about the Dunkirk evacuation. Directed by Nolan and released in 2017, it's pretty good. Early spoilers, the Germans lose. The Germans always lose. In case you somehow weren't aware of that. Wait, hang on, what was this video about? Oh yeah, audio. When a plane flies towards the camera, we don't just hear what the protagonist of the scene is hearing. Rather, we experience the point of hearing of the entire crowd. Though in scenes, the film will swap out perspectives from the crowd's point of hearing to the protagonist's point of hearing. The sequence ends with a switch to Tommy's perspective, lying face down in the sand. Notice how the film allows the sound of the plane to build up and how there's no music getting in the way, because the sound of a descending plane speaks for itself. And the switch to Tommy's perspective in the closing moments gives the audience a sense of the bomb's power. They increase in volume and visual impact as they get closer to him. And the entire film's just filled with wonderful little moments like this. Now, something worth noting about Nolan's films is that they tend to blur the diegetic and non-diegetic. Uh, quick aside here. In the context of film, diegetic sound is any sound that originates from the world. So in Shaun of the Dead, and are diegetic. They originate from the world, the TV or the jukebox. Non-diegetic sound, conversely, originates outside of the world. So any score by John Williams in Star Wars is non-diegetic. Non-diegetic can also cover character narration or comedy sound effects, like what you might see in the Three Stooges. Studio audience laughter in sitcoms would also count as non-diegetic sound as well. So disturbed. Nolan's films from Interstellar onwards have at times seemingly attempted to blur these lines. Take the leitmotif for Tenet's villain, Russian bloke, a man who has lung cancer. Kenneth Branag Br Branags? Sure. Breathing is incorporated into the track, albeit slightly altered. <laughs> So when it plays and he's wearing his mask and we hear the breathing, is it the character on the track? 
Is it diegetic or non-diegetic? I don't know, and I believe Nolan wants that to be the point. Now, you'd think doing this would be a disaster, and you'd be right. It's hard to tell what effect exactly Nolan is going for oftentimes. The more you pay attention to it, the more confusing it becomes. However, Dunkirk stands as an exception here. The sound of Dunkirk understands the noise of war. Silence, the rolling of machines, distant gunfire and shouting. Then the occasional horrendous punctuation where the audio palette is overwhelmed by sensation and hysteria. It should also be noted that Dunkirk doesn't do this very often. It's a lot more conservative and restrained than Nolan's other recent films, and it does a lot more to disguise its efforts. Take this scene, where a plane once again descends on the beach. The music almost sounds like gunfire itself, and it slowly builds up in line with the scene. Before he fires, he's gonna drop his nose. I'll give you the signal. King, Dick King, points out, Loud sounds like explosions are more startling and effective if they're preceded by a little silence. For instance, the scene where the British soldiers are hiding in metal trawler, which the Germans began using as target practice. It's shocking because it's a fairly quiet scene. And he's right, I would agree. The film follows this philosophy throughout, allowing the loud parts of the film to act as a violent punctuation to vast amounts of silence. Wait, hang on a tick. If you understand the effectiveness of silence, then what the fuck was going on in 10? Every director has a weakness. Nolan's problem is centered on his emphasis on emotional spectacle over craft. Nolan wants you to feel his films, not merely watch them. But feeling isn't something you can demand from an audience. It's something you have to earn. And grabbing them by the lapels isn't going to do that. I should note that I could be very well wrong about what Nolan is trying to do. It's possible that Nolan isn't trying to blur the lines between diegetic and non-diegetic audio. It's completely possible I'm just reading far too much into it. After all, Nolan has had very little to say about his own process, at least that I can find. So a lot of my explanation of Nolan's style and philosophy is hearsay from other sources, or just outright conjecture based on observation. It's clear at this point that Nolan isn't the saviour of cinema or any such nonsense like that. But at the end of the day, Nolan's films create a dialogue between people who watch them. It gets people to talk. And engage in discourse. So why is Christopher Nolan? Well, maybe the real Christopher Nolan was the sound design we made along the way. Boo! Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. I know I didn't. Um, until the next time, I suppose if you want.